first of all, thank you, Dr. Newberry, for inviting me to present spay neuter issues in this class. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and also thank you all for being present in person and online as well. And my name is Dr. Kathleen Mekulinski. I currently work for the ASPCA. And in my role there, I work for Veterinary Outreach, which is a department that educates veterinarians, shelter professionals, um, and veterinary students about topics within shelter medicine, one of them being spay neuter issues and free roaming cat management issues. So that's basically what I do at the ASPCA. Before I got there, I helped to set up many spay neuter programs in Buffalo, New York, um, which is in the western part of New York State. Tonight, we're going to talk about um, spay neuter targeting. We covered most techniques earlier in today in the afternoon presentation and also some special, special considerations. And overall, this is just an idea of where we're going to go tonight. First, we're going to overview some related statistics. We're going to spend a fair amount of time looking at pediatric spay neuter because that is a special category of animals and we want to make sure that we're providing adequate care for them throughout the procedure. Um, and then we're going to look at a couple of different populations of animals, how, how to best provide spay and neuter for shelter animals and how to best provide spay and neuter for owned animals. Um, then we're going to look at a community assessment to determine both the strengths and the needs of a community in regard to spay and neuter. And then we're going to spend a fair amount of time on targeting spay and neuter towards at-risk animal populations and we're going to define what at-risk means. So in regard to statistics, there are approximately 5,000 animals, animal shelters in the United States and contrary to popular belief, um, a lot of these animal shelters do not have any sort of oversight by government, by any sort of overarching organization. They pretty much operate independently. We have five to seven million companion animals entering shelters per year and about three to four million animals euthanized in shelters per year. And that equates to about 60% of the dogs in shelters and 70% of the cats in shelters. And it's good to remember that these are national statistics. So certain areas of the country are gonna fare far better than other areas of the country. So it's a little bit more related information. Spay and neuter is valuable in stemming companion overpopulation problem. Um, we have statistics from decades ago which showed that we were euthanizing far, a far greater number of animals than we are currently euthanizing now. So spay neuter and aggressive adoption programs have helped that. Spay neuter is a significant aspect of shelter medicine. Um, shelters can spend up to half of the, a veterinarian's time doing spay and neuter for shelter animals, preparing them to leave as adopted animals. And in general, we think that neuter contracts do not work very well. So that would be when a shelter adopts out an intact animal with the promise from that owner that they ultimately will get that spay and neuter done. And they may even have some sort of incentive to get the spay and neuter done. They'll get a deposit back. They'll get some sort of monetary reimbursement. Um, and it's generally thought that less than, there's less than 60% compliance with spay neuter contracts for adopted animals. Yeah. Is that 60% coming, where does that come from? Is that just an impression? That's a pretty old statistic. Um, and it's often quoted, and I've traced it back to a number of research articles, but ultimately, I think that did come several years ago, which might be different now. Um, but we still, we still would like to see the animals that are coming from our shelters not contributing to the problem that we're trying to prevent. Um, and obviously, best to have animals sterilized before leaving the shelter. And spay neuter is a community issue, not just a shelter issue, because um, lots of animals that come to the shelter, we see that they're not spayed and neutered. Okay. So we're going to spend some time focusing specifically on pediatric spay-neuter, and that's considered to be sterilization between, it's actually 6 and 16 weeks of age. Some shelters do, some spay-neuter programs do pediatric spay-neuter between 6 and 8 weeks of age as well, and they're very successful in doing that. Um, it does, the big bonus here is that it ensures a shelter's ability to neuter before adoption. We don't have a whole bunch of puppies and kittens waiting around or occupying space in foster care that could be spayed and neutered and adopted. 
Um, also, I've seen shelters that try to hold on to puppies and kittens longer than that time frame. And unfortunately, they become ill in the shelter environment because they are very vulnerable to infectious diseases at that age. And also, that's at a very critical point in their social development, and they're not getting socialized properly. Um, and for, for all animals, all of pets included, it prevents accidental pregnancies because we're getting to them before they go into heat. Um, for cats, that could be as early as four months. Um, the surgery tends to be faster, easier, and less expensive because you're, you're using less anesthesia, pain control drugs, less consumable items. And the, the procedure tends to be shorter with a shorter recovery time and healing time. And it's certainly essential in the fight against overpopulation. For our pediatric patients, they do have a decreased glycogen stores, so they do have a predisposition towards hypoglycemia. Um, they also have decreased ability to maintain their body temperature, so they are predisposed to hypothermia. They can have an altered metabolism, and that can affect the excretion of the drugs that we're giving them. And as we mentioned earlier today, we should only fast these guys <clears throat> for about four to six hours prior to surgery, even less, some people say two to four hours. So that it may be that you need to feed the pediatric patient while they're in your care prior to surgery. And we want to offer food within one hour of recovery when they're up and able to eat. Sure, yeah, the question is for free roaming cats that might come in in a trap, we may not be able to estimate their age in weeks. So could we go by the size of the cat, the weight of the animal? Um, and in that case, Generally, healthy kittens gain a pound per month for the first four months, so we could estimate their age based on how much they weigh, but it's always kind of problematic to get an accurate weight on a kitten that's in a trap. So we do sort of estimate, and then once we give an, anest an anesthetic injection, which we may err on the side of having that cat be smaller than we think they really are, once we get them out, we could further evaluate if we think they're a surgical candidate. So surgical considerations for pediatric spay neuter, our incisions tend to be smaller. Um, one thing to get used to when performing pediatric spays on both cats and dogs is that they have a fair amount of clear abdominal fluid. And in some animals, it really just kind of comes gushing out of their abdomen. Um, and you have to kind of catch yourself because a lot of times when you're first starting to do these, you might think you have hit the bladder which is a very scary feeling. Um, but once you do enough of them, <clears throat> you realize that that's just pretty much normal for them. They have very minimal amount of fat surrounding their ovaries. And we find that we can use an ovarian pedicle tie or possibly one ligature on the ovarian pedicles as opposed to two. And we do a routine <coughs> closure on them. I just want to check, do you all know what she's talking about when she's talking about an ovarian pedicle tie? I can explain it. Um, so I know some of yeah, I know some of you guys have had some surgical experience already, but probably most of you have not. And when you learn to do surgery initially, um, you do a clamping technique where you place ligatures around the ovarian pedicle so that when you ultimately remove the ovary, the pedicle doesn't bleed. Um, and, and in most cases, you'll learn to put two ligatures on that ovarian pedicle. But in cats, we have found that much like performing a cat neuter, where we, ex we pull the testicle out and we do a overhand tie, an instrument tie, and then make the spermatic cord into its own knot. We don't place any ligatures. The spermatic cord becomes its own knot. Um, we could do the same thing with feline ovaries, that we isolate the suspensory, pluck the suspensory ligament, isolate the ovarian <coughs> vessels, and wrap the hemostat around that, creating its own knot. Um, and I found that in cats, that that tends to be more efficient, but it, it, at least for me, it tends to be, it, I'm more confident in that knot that it creates than in placing ligatures. And we also, you can't do that in dogs. Um, it, there tends to be too much fat to make that knot secure. People who do this, do high quality, high volume spay neuter, do pedicle ties routinely on all cats, pregnant cats, obese cats, lactating cats, um, they become that confident in the procedure that they prefer to do, do it that way. So 
So here's a picture of a kitten spay, and you can tell just by looking at the instruments that this, the ovaries, that's an ovary, up there is an ovary, that's the <coughs> uterus, and the clamp is at the um, fork of the uterus. So you can tell just by looking at the instruments that the reproductive tract here is teeny tiny. And it does take some manual dexterity to get used to working with um, <coughs> reproductive structures that are that small, but once you get used to it, <coughs> it tends to be a lot easier. And I always tell veterinarians who aren't used to doing space and neuters on pediatric patients, if they start with somebody who's six or seven months old, work their way down to five months, four months, three months, two months, and then they can build their confidence in doing it that way. And again, just looking at puppy reproductive tract, kitten reproductive tract compared to the size of a penny. And that shows the spay incision on a kitten, and just that it's super small and that will heal rather quickly. A lot of people who are doing high quality, high volume spay here are now for puppies doing scrotal, either one scrotal incision or two scrotal incisions, as opposed to doing a pre-scrotal incision. And they also use a hemostat technique to tie the spermatic cord into a knot. <clears throat> and then they do not close the scrotal incision. Um, they let, let it heal much like in a catnip. So there's our puppy, ready for surgery. He has both testicles in his scrotum, thankfully. That is making the scrotal incision pulling out the testicle and the spermatic cord, wrapping the hemostat around the spermatic cord to create a self ligature, cutting off the testicle, and then sliding that part over the hemostat so it creates the knot. And that's the incision. Um, some people leave it open. Other people prefer to roll it inward and put a little bit of tissue adhesive on there. And there's a little puppy up eating rather quickly after surgery. Does anybody have any questions? So what is, what is the like, logic for choosing to do that instead of the scrotal incision? Oh, I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> What's the logic? when deciding whether to do a prescrotal incision or a scrotal incision. And I guess on a puppy, it's really surgeon preference, whatever they have had experience with, whatever works best for them. But it's thought that in pediatric patients that it may be less traumatic to make a smaller incision in the scrotum, and the scrotum kind of, um, kind of shrinks in itself as opposed to the prescrotal skin, which you have to put sutures in. And the dog may then start licking the sutures, biting at the sutures, and it may cause problems. So this is thought of as a way to neuter pediatric patients so that we can avoid the use of sutures for the, for the skin. Yes? Uh, along those same lines, so what happens if you have a puppy that has a scrotal because the scrotum is rather vascular in dogs? Is it less so in it seems just from doing them that they are less vascular in puppies. So you don't have any issues with like hemostasis? No. Nope. But there are people, um, including Dr. Bushby, who is a board certified surgeon, um, teaches veterinary students how to do these things at the University of um, Mississippi, and he advocates for doing scrotal uh, castrations in adult dogs. In, in his hands, that seems to be the best way to prevent postoperative complications. And the reason he does it is because he thinks that a prescrotal incision will cause serum or possibly even blood to pool in the scrotum and cause a scrotal hematoma. In, in making an incision within the scrotum and leaving it partially open, there is the opportunity for drainage so that for a day or two that dog may lose some fluid, but at least it won't turn into a big scrotal hematoma. Okay, so there's been lots of talk and research about concerns regarding pediatric spay neuter. Does it have any long-term detrimental effects? And we're gonna discuss just a couple of the items that come up frequently, um, obesity being one of it one of them and it's unclear whether age at time of sterilization has any effect on subsequent obesity 
Um, it's important to remember that obesity is not a mandatory consequence of sterilization at any age and controllable with an appropriate diet and exercise regimen. Um, also commonly reported was diameter of the penile urethra in male cats is decreased and numerous studies have failed to detect any correlation between sterilization of cats at any age and a decrease in their um, diameter of their urethra. Another concern is urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence in female dogs. <clears throat> and one study showed that it, there was an increased urinary incontinence um, before, if they were spayed, if dogs were spayed prior to three months of age. So they recommended that it may be a good idea to wait until at least three months of age. But a different study did not reach this conclusion. So I think it's really important <laughs> that we recognize that the pros and cons of the population that we have to deal with. If we're going to have to keep puppies in the shelter for an extra month to reach that three month age, it's probably not a good idea because they'll be vulnerable to catching infectious diseases and uh, like we said before, that's their critical socialization period. Dr. Sandra Newberry mentioned that for the one study that showed <clears throat> a possible potential for increased urinary incontinence in dogs spayed under three months of age, um, those dogs were not relinquished at any higher rate to shelters because of that problem. And there's a chapter within the Shelter Medicine book, the second edition, that is very, a very comprehensive review of a lot of different studies about this topic. Um, Dr. Jan Scarlett is an epidemiologist from Cornell University, and if you have other questions about that, that would be a very good read um, because she summarizes a lot of those articles. Um, but basically, we think that the benefits of performing spay neuter at this age far outweigh any potential detriments, um, and it, it's best for owned animals to have that conversation with the veterinarian about what, what age is best to perform spay neuter for. Okay, so we're going to switch gears again um, to discuss spay neuter for the specific population, those animals within shelters. And obviously our goal here is to get animals out of shelters in as quickly, as quick a manner as possible and get them into a home environment. Unfortunately, spay and neuter can create a bottleneck in that process. Um, we have animals that are unaltered in the shelter and we have shelters with very good intentions of wanting to spay and neuter them prior to leaving as adopted animals but they end up waiting um, for whatever reason that, to the point where they're waiting excessively in the shelter, their length of stay is increasing because they're not receiving spay and neuter in a timely fashion. And that can be because of insufficient spay and neuter capacity. The shelter just doesn't have the resources to spay those animals in a timely, in a timely manner. And also it could be because of lack of daily rounds that the shelter just doesn't have an efficient process for who's next on the surgical list, of building their surgical list for the next day. So our options for shelter animals, we can provide spay and neuter within the shelter, or we can transport them to an off-site location for spay and neuter. And if shelters are doing off-site spay and neuter, there's lots of things to be considered in terms of developing a budget for that and seeing how much that costs. They have to factor in the actual cost of surgery, um, which depending on where you are in, in, in the country, veterinarians may charge vastly different rates for dog, cats, bees, and neuters. Um, and even if that veterinarian is giving the shelter a discount, it may still be quite steep. They also have to have compensation for staff to transport animals back and forth to the animal hospital, um, cost to insure, fuel, and maintain transport vehicles, and a system in place and a budget for following up with any post-operative complications. If a shelter chooses to do on-site spay and neuter, there's a, there's a whole another list of things they need to consider. Purchasing and maintaining equipment to do the spays and neuters on site. Um, ongoing purchase of consumable items. Obviously, they have to have a veterinarian to pr perform the procedure and um, qualified medical support staff. And regardless of which they, ch which they choose, which they're able to provide, spay and neuter services for shelter animals should be provided in a timely manner and not cause an increase in their length of stay. 
And also we think about the animal's experience in having that increased length of stay. Um, they may be predisposed to getting infectious disease, their mental health and behavioral welfare may decline, uh, but also it is wasting resources for that shelter. We have a cage, a kennel that's being occupied and when it really doesn't have to be occupied and that shelter could be using that kennel for the next animal to come in who really does need their help. So spay and neuter for shelter animals, oftentimes shelters have to make the decision, are we going to spay and neuter dogs and cats before they're placed into adoption areas so that when people come in to adopt them, they can take the animal home that day? Or are we going to place animals in adoption areas and have the person come adopt them and then have to wait a day, two, three days to actually take that animal home so that they can get spayed and neutered? And oftentimes, successful shelters do a combination of both of those. They'll have animals <clears throat> that they know are probably going to get adopted pretty quickly. They'll have those animals already be spayed and neutered. And for dogs and cats who they historically can tell that may have a bit, need a bit more time to become adopted, those animals, they will already have reserved a certain number of spots on their surgery list so that they can quickly accommodate those animals as they become adopted. Okay, we're going to switch to talking about spay and neuter of owned animals, and we're going to discuss a study that is entitled Companion Animal Knowledge, Attachment, and Pet Care, and their associations with household demographics for residents of a rural Texas town. And basically, this study showed that 74% of companion cats were sterilized. And there's been lots of studies that try to measure how many of our cats and dogs within homes are currently sterilized. That figure is a little bit lower than some of the other studies. And we say, wow, 74%. Why do we have a problem? Why is this a big issue if we have all these cats already spayed and neutered? But this study and other studies have shown that a large percentage of those cats here, 20 of 30 of the cats that had, had a litter prior to sterilization. So people <clears throat> aren't proactively seeking spaying of these cats until they've already had a litter. And then that litter goes on to contribute to the problem. Uh, and they asked these folks of all the litters produced, which how many were accidental, and 85% said that these were accidental litters. They certainly weren't planned. Um, also, very important for us as shelter veterinarians to convey this information to veterinarians in private practice so that they can, can have these conversations with their clients, so that they can start even with the earliest kitten visit, even with the earliest puppy visit, to start priming them to perform spays and neuters at an appropriate time to prevent those oops litters. And we recommend, generally recommend, that even for owned animals, spaying and neutering be done. Private practitioners may not be on board with 6 to 16 weeks of age. Um, and for those owned animals, it may be a good idea for them to develop uh, immunity through vaccination. So at four months of age or older, we could be timing their last vaccines with spay and neuter procedure. And it's still prior to the development of sexual maturity, so it will prevent accidental litters. And I, I often thought, like when I was in private practice, we would do that last vaccine at about four months, and then say, oh, give us a call at six to eight months, and we'll schedule a spay and neuter. But how many of those people really do that? Um, if we scheduled it with the last vaccinations or soon after, we might gain an overall increased compliance with having people perform that procedure. <coughs> Okay, so we're jumping around a bit, but all, all important issues, I think, for young budding veterinarians. Um, next, we're going to look at community assessment to determine spay and neuter needs. And whenever I work with a community that wants to set up a spay and neuter program or enhance what they currently have, they oftentimes jump right to the, right to the end. Like, when can we start doing spays and neuters? Um, when can we open? And it really takes an investment of time, energy, and money um, to do it right, to get it right the first time. So when we're looking <clears throat> at our community to see what their space and neuter needs are, um, one really good resource that we have is the ASPCA PetSmart Charities Low Cost Spay and Neuter Clinic Database. 
and that was developed over the, about the past five years. If you go to ASPCA Pro, you'll see a database where you can enter either a city or a state or a zip code, and you can choose the radius that you want to um, see the data for. And up will pop either Spaniard or clinics, or we have this has the capacity to give the names of Spaniard or programs. They may be voucher programs that are, you can go and get a voucher and take that to your own veterinarian. So if you know of any spay neuter programs, look them up on here, see if they're on here. And if they're not on here, please tell us so that we can list them so people can find them. How can, how can we let the ASPCA know either that there is a new spay neuter program forming or that the spay neuter program that's currently listing, listed is no longer functional? And when, last time I looked at this site, if you go down farther, there should be a way to contact the site administrator or even for adding new programs, add it in yourself. Um, also, I know a lot of you guys were here this morning. Just so you don't have to like copy the website of this, of this tool, I have a resource guide that I typed up. So any of the studies that we see, any of the websites that, you, that we see, if you have a, an interest in uh, finding out more about those specific details, you can find them on the resource guide. And for our online folks, we'll post that PDF of the resource guide on the Shelter Medicine website. Okay, step two in our community assessment. Who is currently not seeking spay and neuter and why? And we're fortunate here because we do have some studies that were done, one by HSUS, and that was done after Hurricane Katrina. Um, it's entitled Messaging Spay and Neuter Lessons from the Gulf Coast Spay and Neuter Campaign. And the other is a pet adoption and spay and neuter, understanding public perceptions by the numbers. They, pet Smart Charities did this once in 2009, and they more recently did the study in 2012. So you can see how answers have changed. Both of those can be found online. And basically both of those studies came up with very similar reasons of what the barriers are to people obtaining spay and neuter. When reasons often uh, cited by owners are, ha are cost. It's too costly to do this. Um, pretty, pretty interesting is haven't gotten around to it, which means that people have the intention of doing it, but it's just not seen as an urgent matter, matter for them, matter for them, um, that it's not necessary. The pet is confined to a home that the pet's too young, but in the PetSmart charity study, if you dug into that a little bit deeper, we found that people didn't know when an appropriate time was to have their pets be. People said that they intended to breed the animal. Some said that they were unaware of a spay and neuter program, and some mentioned that they were aware of the spay and neuter program, but they simply couldn't access it. Other animal populations that may have difficulty obtaining spay and neuter, so that was owned animals. Um, animals in rescues, animals in shelters sometimes have difficulty finding spay and neuter resources. Free roaming cats, and in general, owned pit bulls, um, just because there tends to be a lot of them, and also because they may be in a um, in a an area where it's difficult to find resources to have their pit, bull, their pit bull spayed at an affordable cost. Okay, step three. We want to design spay and neuter programs to serve animals not currently being spayed or neutered. And we need to decide at that point, are we going to better utilize in a currently existing program or are we going to develop a new spay and neuter program? <clears throat> and step four, to, it, we want to implement or enhance the spay neuter program to provide service for a currently underserved animal population and build capacity within those programs to serve as many animals as possible. Um, and that's really where we used to stop <laughs> with the community assessment. <clears throat> build the program, build capacity, serve as many animals as possible, and hope for the best. Um, we really had no means of measuring impact of these programs. And also, we may not have been using our limited resources in a manner that had the greatest impact on animals at risk. And we're going to define what at risk means. 
in a little bit. But now, when I give this presentation, I say, but wait, there's more. Um, so, and the more is, how can we better utilize our limited resources? Everybody has limited resources. How can we best utilize them to target spaying and neutering towards animal, needy animal populations? And here, we're going to hear from you because those of you who have been with me since this morning are probably very sick of hearing me. So we're going to listen to you guys for a little bit. And the questions that we have to ponder here are within animal populations not currently being spayed and neutered, who are the animals most at risk for losing their life? And the second question is, how can we best measure the impact that spay and neuter services have in a community? So what we're going to do, um, if you can just break off into little non-official groups, discuss this with your friends for probably two or three minutes, and then we'll have representatives of those groups share their answers with all of us. Okay, we're going to come back together. We're going to hear what our folks in the chat online are saying. So um, what people are saying online is, um, sorry, is lots of things actually. Let me tell you guys just so you can get a sense. They're saying animals most at risk would include shelter animals, community cats, litters of puppies or kittens that are turned into shelters because the owner of the mother doesn't want them, animals roaming who are picked up by animal control, um, and that was seconded, and also uh, free roaming and barn cats. And then I said, well, which of those do you think is the most at risk? Um, for euthanasia, measure the impact by evaluating decrease in animals entering local shelters, litters being advertised as free in local newspapers. Um, for euthanasia, I would say animals picked up by animal control and feral free roaming cats. Um, community cats are at high risk because if they do get taken into local animal control, they are not placed for adoption. Um, free roaming and barn kittens have a poor survival rate in winter time in Wisconsin, though, so they're at risk in a different way from that perspective. Um, so let's hear from our group here. Would you guys like to go first? The, que the answer was that free roaming cats are most at risk for losing their life. Are, are those free roaming cats that enter shelters? Those for free roaming cats that stay on the streets, or both? Okay, so the answer was uh, the ones that are picked up and brought into shelters are, are probably the ones that are going to lose their life. Okay. So thank you very much. How about you guys in the back row? So the answer there was uh, pit bulls. They're at risk when they come into the shelter because there's so many of them and they can be difficult to place that they're more at risk for being euthanized in the shelter. Anybody else from the back row? So again, we hear the answer of pit bulls, free roaming cats. We're seeing lots of them come through our shelters with limited resources of getting them out of our shelters alive. So the answer there, a little bit of a different pro approach to that question, um, that younger animals may be more at risk for roaming to find mates. And if those guys are picked up, they may be in, in the shelter and more difficult to adopt if they didn't have proper training or socialization to make them good adoption candidates. Anybody else? Good, thank you. So we kind of, we kind of went into the second question there of how we can best measure impact of spay neuter services have in the community. And that group came up with um, and con complaint calls that were received by animal control. If those were decreasing, then we would, we would assume that there's fewer animals causing problems within those communities. Great, so their answer was kittens or puppies of animals that are not spayed and neutered and animals who do have behavior problems that are relinquished to shelters. Great, so for our online folks, that was a group that recognized that rabbits are often relinquished to shelters and they're at high risk for euthanasia. Uh, because of illness or because simply of having too, too many of them. Um, so anybody who also wants to address the second question, how can we best measure impact of spay neuter services in our communities? Yeah, great. So monitor intake. If we're targeting certain animal populations for spay neuter, hopefully we would see that population decrease in intake of the, in our shelters. You can also measure the euthanasia rate. And then if you combine the shelter intake, 
euthanasia rate, then you could also use it to measure how much your services were getting used. So if your services were getting used at a certain point and euthanasia is going down and shelter intake is going down and your use of services is going down, it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing a bad job at advertising, it could mean you're doing your job. That's very good. So they're combining the euthanasia rate with um, shelter intake rate and also seeing how many people are utilizing your services, the Spain your services. Yes? I would um, wonder if you have a successful spin year program, if it would alter the number of unaltered or already sterilized animals coming into the shelter. Yeah, that's a really good point. So when we're asking people upon intake if their animal has already been spayed and neutered, we'd hope to see a greater percentage of those animals being spayed and neutered upon intake. Okay, so really great answers. Um, you guys really think about this and obviously you've all had some experience in shelters to be able to figure this out. Okay, so what the common denominator that I heard here was that animals at, at risk animals are those that re, for some, they're in a category that, uh, that is surrendered to two shelters at a high rate. And that may be free roaming cats, that may be pit bulls, but they're being surrendered to shelters where they're at risk for euthanasia. And like we've said time and time again, they're also, even if they're not being euthanized, they're at risk for developing infectious diseases and having their welfare, their behavior, their quality of life deteriorate. So <clears throat> this is um, basically a summary of what we were, have been discussing. Um, all spays and neuters are important, but unlimited we, unlimited resources need to be spent wisely. So Dr. Emily Weiss, who we're going to talk about a targeted program that she's developed, um, says that all spays and neuters are important, but all spays and neuters are not created equally. We do have to divvy up our resources to create the greatest impact. Um, and we, here we want to focus spay and neuter on animals most at risk to entering shelters for, for reasons of overpopulation. And if we are measuring, if we are doing that, it gives us a means to measure the impact of our spay neuter efforts. <clears throat> so how can we best target these resources towards animals entering shelters? Um, and we have a couple different options, and here we're going to focus mostly on geography. So if we look at our intake statistics, we can look at zip codes. We can look at areas of high intake and try to determine by zip code which areas we should be focusing most of our spay neuter resources. The problem with zip codes, in some areas of the country, zip codes don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, we may have a large number of animals coming from one area of the zip code, and we won't know that. We may be targeting our resources towards the entire zip code and actually end up targeting resources in an inappropriate manner. So Dr. Emily Weiss at the ASPCA has developed a geographic information system to help us with this targeting effort. And here is a big long definition of what geographic information system is. Um, it integrates hardware, software, and data for capturing, managing, analyzing, and displaying all forms of geographical, geographically referenced information. It allows us to view, understand, question, interpret, and visualize data in many ways that reveal relationships, patterns, and trends in the form of, mostly for our purposes, maps. <clears throat> so, what does that really mean? Um, for our purposes, GIS has the ability to map a shelter's intake data so that we can easily visualize data and, more importantly, make informed decisions based on that data. And this is an example of a GIS map that is in Bun Buncombe County, North Carolina. And for those of you who were here with us this morning, um, this is the location of Humane Alliance. This is where that very large um, spay neuter clinic, stationary spay neuter clinic that offers a mentorship program is located. Okay, so this shows cat intake <coughs> data for the whole county. <coughs> so everywhere where we see a red plus sign, that is one cat intake. And we do that because we have accurately obtained the address of that cat upon intake. If we can't obtain the address, we have at least obtained the cross street of where that cat came from. 
So you can see there's clusters of cat intakes. And we, we can overlay that map with a map showing spay and neuter. Um, so here we have a shelter collecting data on intake. We also have the Humane Alliance collecting intake on the spays and neuters that they're doing for cats in the area. And I'm going to move away, so hopefully this is OK. Um, and we can see that there's pockets of where spay and neuter are occurring where intake is not high. And then we see that, like right here. And then we see the opposite, where spay and neuter <clears throat> is occurring, sorry, and intake is not high, or where intake is high and spay and neuter is not occurring. So the, the director of the Humane Alliance took, took a look at this map and said, boy, we are a really large spay and neuter organization maybe we can be utilizing our resources in a little bit better manner to help these cats from becoming at risk for shelter intake. This is another map. <coughs> this shows New York City. This is dog intake, pit bull type dogs by neighborhood. And the darker the color, the greater number of dogs that are entering shelters. This shows the same map, <clears throat> but it eliminates the arbitrary neighborhood um, definitions, and it just shows density of the darker the colors, the greater the density of intake. <clears throat> this is a really important map. This is also New York City. The green circles represent one um, pit bull type dog intake from those areas. The blue circles represent one pit bull puppy intake. So green is adult, blue is puppy. So we can see that there's a large number of adult dogs, far greater number of adult dogs who are being surrendered than puppies. So in this specific case, this data would lead us to believe, lead us to go back and look at why these adult dogs are being surrendered. There's actually, they're doing a study about that in New York City. Um, and we may find in this particular case that this isn't an overpopulation issue. <clears throat> this may be adult dogs being surrendered for other reasons. Um, that they can no longer afford to care for the dog. That they can no longer um, afford food for the dog. That they can, they're having trouble with behavior training for uh, juvenile or adult pit bulls. And so if we look at that data, we might say spay and neuter is a safety net program. But maybe in this case, we need to provide different safety net programs to keep these, this particular population of dogs from entering shelters. So what is needed for a successful GIS program? And we need community collaboration, which we'll see why. And we need squeaky clean data. And community collaboration, um, best to use spay neuter resources to best use spay neuter resources, we need local shelters to share their intake data or their maps with spay neuter programs. In a, in a lot of communities, the same organization might be running intake. They might have a facility as a shelter, and they may also run the spay neuter program. <clears throat> so in that case, it's not as important to have community collaboration because the same organization can obtain both intake data and data about the animals that they're spaying and neutering. However, in some communities, the local shelter may be separate, independent from the organization who is providing spay and neuter. Um, and in those cases, I've had a lot of spay and neuter organizations come to me and say, we really want to use GIS. We recognize the power of this and how it can help the animals in our community. They go to their local shelter, and the local shelter will not give them that intake data. <clears throat> For whatever reason, they don't want that intake data to be public. Um, and they don't want it relinquished in that manner. So here, this is a case where we really need to work on community collaboration um, to try to help those shelters realize that what, they're, what the spay neuter program is trying to do is make their job easier um, to decrease the number of animals that are coming into their shelters. And then we need an ongoing relationship between those two organizations to judge the impact of spay neuter interventions and refocus effort um, resources as needed in the future. So in terms of data, 
Um, in order to do this successfully, we need 85% of the community's animals intake data, and that might be, in some areas, that's one shelter. They're taking in 85% of that community's animals. In other areas, that may be multiple shelters, who, again, will need to collaborate um, to have this program work. Also, 80% of the records need to contain all necessary data, and that is accurate uh, listing of species, breed, the intake type. <clears throat> was this animal a stray? Did it come from an owner? Was it transferred in by another organization? Also, the intake date. We want to know the age, the gender, and if we think this animal was feral or uh, really was this animal free roaming, <laughs> Um, and was it spayed or neutered at the time of intake. And extremely important, we want to know the address of the animal or the cross street. We want to know the city, the state, the zip code, and also the animal's ID number. <clears throat> so this is for a shelter upon intake, but then for the spay-neuter program, we also want this data. And there, a common challenge is that we might have um, a, a nice uh, feral cat caregiver <laughs> who is caring for multiple colonies. And when she comes in to have these cats speed and neuter, she's going to give her own address on every record. And that, that's very common um, in spay and neuter programs. But what we don't want her address, we want the address of where each of those cats was trapped. Um, so that may be a change in protocol for the way, the, the way that spay and neuter program keeps its records. <clears throat> and also, in order to keep clean data on the shelter side, that may take tweaking of the software program, and also staff training so that they realize the importance of inputting this data in a clean manner. Um, and also the communities that we've worked with, we, we go back and we look at their data for six months to a year, and it's very rare that we, get, we find shelters that have this all under control on the onset. Usually they need to go back and clean their data, or they need to, in, they need to implement systems so that they can collect data, data clean data um, prospectively. And here's an example of an, of an address situation of why clean data is so important. <clears throat> and it's very similar to the fer feral cat um, example we just gave. We want to do very targeted spay and neuter so that we reach the animals who are most at risk for shelter intake. If we're using the wrong addresses for shelter intake, will target the wrong areas. And there's a map. Um, and if this is where the animal was found, but that's where the finder lives, obviously the finder's address doesn't tell us which area needs our help the most. <clears throat> and this is an example of a breed problem with data. Um, this is Portland, Oregon, and Oregon on the south, Washington, North. Here we have um, two shelters. One is classifying pit bull type dogs as, an Amer as American pit bull. Those are the blue circles. One shelter is classifying pit bull type dogs as American pit bull terrier. And both shelters have yet another category, which is American Staffordshire terrier, which is yellow. So there's a spattering of yellow across the whole thing. So in this case, if we really wanted to target our spay neuter services toward pit bull type dogs, it would be difficult because we can't retrieve that information from our current data system. So really important to have those systems set up that we're all recording the same things. And we're very fortunate that ASPCA has developed lots of GIS resources for communities who want to give this a try. Um, we work with PetSmart charities and we have a number of communities that were very proactive in trying to help to set this up. But there's other communities who've contacted us, and they can't be part of that official mentoring system. But they've done this on their own. Uh, they've gone, they've seen how to clean their data, how to prepare maps, and a lot of them are finding uh, GIS resources within universities to help them actually map their data. This is an example. This is a map, again, of Buncombe County in North Carolina. And this shows um, a spay neuter focus area outlined in red, right there. The little triangles are actually intake of cat litters. So the green, the dark green, is three to four. 
um, number of cat litters. And then it goes light green, yellow to red. Red indicates a greater number of cat litters being surrendered. So they defined their area of focus um, by a high concentration of cat litters being surrendered. And this is Humane Alliance. They're, they're pretty confident in their ability to get people through the door. Um, they have a tried and true method of outreach, um, something that they're comfortable with in order to advertise their services and reach the populations that they're seeking. So in that area, they passed out 3,000 flyers and they asked on their intake form, how did you hear about us? And they found that only 20 of those were redeemed. So we find this a lot in these programs where we're trying to target populations of animals that we, that we historically have not tried to target before. Um, traditional out, outreach methods may not work in these areas. And tradition, by traditional outreach methods, we mean flyers, newspaper ads, bus ads, billboards, things that we expect people to look at, read, internalize, and make a decision. Um, there are also in these communities maybe barriers of language. <clears throat> they may not understand something that's written in English. Um, also, they may not understand what spay or neuter means. Uh, when you actually go out on the street and engage people in conversations about this, they may be too embarrassed to admit it, but ultimately through the conversation, you get an understanding that they don't know what those words mean. Um, and it also, in some cases, it's simple survival. It's not on these people's radar to have their animals spayed and neutered when they're merely trying to survive and provide food for their children. So outreach becomes vital in achieving our spay and neuter goals in these targeted populations. So, glad you kept sitting with your partners. <laughs> We're going to think for a minute <clears throat> about developing a list of at least two new ways to reach people in these targeted geographic areas with our spay and neuter message. So this would be something out of the box, something that's different from a flyer or a newspaper ad or a billboard. So again, we'll take about three, four minutes to do that. We can have our online discussion as well, and then we'll come back to the group and share our ideas. Okay, we're going to come back together. We're going to hear what the online folks have to say. So they're, uh, they're saying church bulletins, work with social service agencies, food pantries, food banks, etc. to reach low-income populations. Thank you. Okay, so let's start on this side of the room this time. Anybody want to contribute? Great idea. So his um, group's comment was <clears throat> possibly having a mobile clinic to go into those targeted communities, offer free services, and strike up the discussion about Spain there. Yep. Um, so perhaps this might not be applicable to everybody, but we were thinking just social media. I mean, most people, I feel, have access to the internet and are on Facebook or something along those lines. So potentially you could reach a lot of people um, via that route without having to actually print stuff or any I mean, of free outlet to try to get your information out there. Um, we also kind of thought like targeting local area things like food pantries and stuff like that and just try to get the education out there or get educate a couple of people, like word of mouth will get around and they might educate a couple more people about it. Um, simple steps. Great. So the comment there was using social media. And we recognize that it may not reach all groups, but it may be effective in reaching <clears throat> some groups, that it's free, um, and that people um, have access to it, and seem to be, it seems to be a very popular way of spreading the word these days. Yep? We came up with um, the food pantries also, and then um, pet stores. Um, two of us worked at PetSmart, actually, and that's, Pretty much the first place a lot of people go when they get their new puppy is they come and get their supplies and they usually ask about like vaccination clinics and everything else so I think that'd be a good opportunity. Great. Um, so the comment there was food banks um, for people and even now some communities have food banks for animals. That might be a good way to engage people in conversation and also pet stores. Uh, people when they get a new animal they go to the pet store for supplies 
And also, oftentimes, they're asking pet store employees about uh, proper care for their animal. If we had um, shelter representatives there, we could give out accurate information. Yeah, great. So the comment there was um, humane education in schools for children so that they can take that information back home to their parents. In places that I've seen that also, um, that seems to remove a langu language barrier because if the adults may not speak English, the children can bring that information home in a language that's easily understood by the adult. Yeah? An ambassador in the community, um, so somebody that they know and they feel comfortable with, um, speaks their language, and is you know, pro Spaniard. Um, so I'd love to see that in, um, especially in the areas of higher people population. Um, I've even seen it with uh, groups that are rescue groups that work on targeting different farms and different feral colonies. They're working with people, and these people are willing to give their animals and have them come in for Spaniard because they trust this yep. person with their animals. That's a huge issue of finding somebody within your targeted areas that the community trusts um, because they're and I, I sometimes think of this in terms of my own neighborhoods if I have an outsider come into my own neighborhood I'm not going to really trust them I, I would prefer that my neighbor or my friend deliver that message to me I would view them as a more credible resource so great idea to have um, community ambassadors people who can deliver that message for you one way, too, that we sort of try to find those ambassadors is we have we've had twice now what are called community dog days, where we've gone into an area that we know is high intake and um, put, gave them a lot of free things, had vaccines for free, microchips. Um, we talked to them about spay and neuter when we were there. A lot of people weren't interested in it. We had some people sign up and say that they were, but then none of them showed up. So that's why I like the mobile idea, because they say, yeah, sure, that sounds great, do it now. You know, mm -hmm. get it while I think it's hot, and before they forget and you know, sleep in and don't make it right. for the next day. So I have three comments, and I hope I remember them all. Um, one, the, 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 th the idea that people may not show up, um, it's, found, it's been found, like I used to think, I give people this information, it's the right thing to do, for heaven's sakes, do it. But you really have to do multiple touches with these people in order to convince them that it's the right thing to do. And I think as, as an industry, we haven't recognized that. That we expect people to make that decision on the spot, whereas they may need a couple of reminders. And programs that we're going to show you an example of um, has a very systematic way of following up with people to keep that at the forefront. <clears throat> the other comment that I had, um, I visited Emancipet in um, Austin, Texas, and they, much like you su suggested, they have a wellness clinic that goes on concurrently with their mobile spay neuter clinic. So they pull up to a site, they already have spays and neuters scheduled for that day, but anybody who comes through their mobile clinic, they can turn that into a spay neuter appointment on the spot. And I think medically to myself, well, those animals are fasted. Do I really want them coming in for spay neuter? But then I turn around and I see the pack of nine dogs running down the street, and I gotta weigh the pluses and minuses of doing that. And I think in those particular cases, it's vastly more beneficial for those animals to have be spayed and neutered on the spot that day. So I love those kinds of programs, and I wish I was telling you this earlier. I really wish that um, shelters would couple adoption with those community days because I think there's nothing more powerful than giving someone a spayed and neutered pet. It's, that's the easiest way to get them to spay and neuter their pet is to give them one that's already spayed and neutered and vaccinated. And it's also the easiest way to build trust, I think, in those communities is if we really show them that we trust them with the animals that we have in our shelter, we're asking them to trust us, but often we actually don't trust them back and we need to really show them that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not really a spay neuter pet to give them, but <laughs> I had also wondered about if you have a spay neuter plant and if you can get like a local sponsor or some sort of corporate sponsorship, 
even if it's on a lower level, like anybody who brings their pets in monthly, we're going to do a drawing, and you may win something, you may be able to sway those people that are kind of on the fence or indifferent either way. Yep, and there's been some incentive type programs tried. Um, there was a program, I forget where, it was called Junk for Jordans. Nice. <laughs> they would give. Yeah. There's extra balls too. Yeah, so obviously they would give a reward if you brought your animal in to have a neuter. Um, and those programs have success in some areas, they're not successful in others. I mean, the bottom line is this is so new that we don't really know what's going to work. A lot of communities are trying things and trying to measure the impact to see what's going to work particularly well in their communities. Okay, so thank you very much for contributing those great ideas. Um, we're going to discuss a program that, has, that contains a lot of the components that you guys already mentioned. It's called HSUS Pets for Life Program. And this is just off their website. Um, Pets for Life builds humane communities using innovative strategies and fresh approaches designed to extend the reach of animal services, resources, and information to underserved areas. Um, addressing the critical need for accessible, affordable pet care, Pets for Life helps animals by empowering the people who care for them. We're not making these decisions for them. We're empowering the people to make their own decisions, to make the right decisions for their pets. And they really do, they embed themselves in, their, in these communities. Um, I've gone to a training session and they say that they have lunch in restaurants within these communities. They visit the local barber shop. They become a member of that community to build credibility and trust. Um, they meet meeting people in the neighborhoods where they live, marketing services strategically, using canvassing and community organizing techniques, much more effective than traditional advertising in reaching owners of altered pets in underserved communities. Um, and adic they've recognized that adequate follow-up is critical to building these relationships and ensuring that the animal's veterinary needs are met. So we're going to show a video of the Pets for Life program. And this is their newest video. It came out in February. <laughs> We all love our animals, so to finally have some, you know, to have a program here actually willing to help out the community and their pets is just awesome. Oh, gosh. You heard about the free event that we're having? You have any, uh, any animals at home? We're with the Humane Society of the United States Pets for Life, so our goal is to give people the resources that they need to hold on to their pets and keep them healthy. He was so cute, but it's just that I couldn't do the right things for them. Oh, Pets for Life really emphasizes the human component in animal welfare. We do an in-depth community assessment which takes into consideration shelter numbers and euthanasia numbers but also economic numbers. We really try to central in on the community that's in the most need. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. We're giving, giving away free shots, free cat food, free dog food. What? Free spay and neuter. Yep. All my friends are cat love. They got cat. It helps because right now money is tight. When this <laughs> Pets for Life program was just a, an idea in our minds, we knew it was going to be something really special. But we didn't know just how special it would be. Peace and thank you for the four legs. All right now. All right, bud. Pets for Life is a program all about being proactive instead of reactive. We're going to stop dogs and cats from coming to the shelter. We're going to stop the suffering that's going on in the communities through this program. Uh, the best thing about Pets for Life is really connecting with the community. There's your baby. And realizing that a lot of the stereotypes we see and we think about or we hear through the media are not true. Miss Betty. Miss Betty is an animal lover. She's probably been an animal lover her whole life. And she's probably never met other people who love animals as much as she does. We were all here to train because they're gonna start a program like this in their cities. Now she's this ambassador. She's she's an amazing spokesperson on these important issues so she can now deliver and she actively delivers this information to people in her community so that 
helps to spread the message. I, I, I think if we, it's what we know, we spread it around. Yeah. And that's what I try to do. They gotta find Miss <laughs> Betty in all their cities. <laughs> when you help people that you know that really love their pets, you know, it's satisfaction is, oof, is very rewarding. <laughs> oh yeah, here we are. It's my pumpkin right here. Um, a lot of people love it. They're excited that it's actually free. Um, they always ask us, like, what's the catch? What's the catch? There is no catch to the program. We've been asked how much everything costs, and we say free. Everything we provide is free, and there are no strings attached. What's the catch? No catch. It's free. There is no catch. I always say the only catch is just to continue to love your animal, and we'll continue to be here to help you do that. getting ready for our huge outreach event. As you can see, it's 7.58 in the morning. We don't start till 10 a.m. And look at the line already. <laughs> it is incredible. This is a good showing, right? It looks like a football field out here. <laughs> I really, really like the program. Me being from this community, I, I definitely see uh, the impact that it's making on everyone around. Is anyone in that bag? <laughs> we want to get to the pet owners before they get to the shelter before the pets need rescue and try to keep them in the homes and, and really kind of elevate the bond between people and pets. So happy that I have the dog. Spots too. <laughs> Look at the dog. <laughs> she know what it is. You, see, you like this? Look, she know what it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for the dog food. It'll really help. That's amazing how you guys can do this for us. I loved it. They neutered, they sprayed, they got microchipped, they got everything. Nails done. Nails <laughs> From done. nails done, hair done, everything the done, done. Works. <laughs> the whole works. Yes. As soon as she gets old enough, we're going to get her spayed and neutered. Yes. Yes. What we have forgotten is that by helping the pets, we actually do help the people because they care about their pets and they want to have the best life for them and their pets together. We talk a lot in the Pets for Life program about general wellness and about getting animals spayed and neutered. But the key to it is the relationship building. And from building relationships and from building trust with people in these communities, the spay and neuters come. Um, so I told them that I was going to play the HSUS Pets for Life video and they said, hey, we have something similar going on here in, uh, in Madison. And then you reminded us that the shelter is doing something very similar as an outreach project and we have the video of that as well. We're here today at our first Community Dog Day of the year, and Community Dog Day is an event that's a collaboration between Dane County Humane Society, the Boys and Girls Club of Dane County, Mounds Pet Food Warehouse, and a grant by the ASPCA. And basically what we want to do with these events are go into specific communities, specific parts of the city where we see a high number of stray dogs, and especially pit bull terriers. The inspiration for our Community Dog Days was that we saw certain pockets of our city with high straight intake numbers at our shelter. So we decided to go right to those neighborhoods, do some community outreach, meet some people, and see what we can do to help them and support them, keeping their dogs in their homes and happy and healthy. And did you get to the vet for some water? No, okay, so this is the first try? Yes. Okay. Oh, you didn't even yeah. know. Okay, okay. <laughs> you didn't even know. You didn't even know. You guys are good pair. <laughs> How old are you? 10. That's awesome. We hope to go directly into these neighborhoods and really make a connection with the residents and be able to educate them on the services that DCHS can provide to them. Is there any symptoms of um, worms? Yeah, sometimes not. So there's no way to tell by looking at them externally if there's worms or not. So that's why we do three D worms just in case. Wow, what a good boy. Good job. All right. This is one particular neighborhood that we came to to show support and to offer resources and advice to the pet owners here we seem to get a lot of strays from. Um, so here we were able to give vaccinations, microchips, 
um, supplies, all kinds of fun stuff, and also just help them with general questions about pet care and pet training. Sometimes they get little clumps in here, and little rocks will stick. So the more you play with her feet and feel inside, the better off she'll be. Hi! <laughs> I put chapstick on. Thank you for the kid. Nice kiss. <laughs> So the rabies goes in the right rear leg and the distemper farmer goes in the shoulder and then the microchip goes on the hind leg. So I heard it from my neighbor. Uh, she informed me that program down here was going on to get your dog's shots tagged and nails trimmed. I came down and saved me a lot of money. I appreciate it. We found that several of the people in this area obviously love, love, love their pets, but they're in situations where they have to make difficult choices about whether or not they can feed or vaccinate or take care of their pet or feed themselves or take care of their children. So um, by doing this, we're hoping that we can help them give their pet the things they need, just those basics, food, vet care, proper supplies and things like that, so that they don't have to struggle with those hard decisions and they can keep that pet um, in a home where it's obviously very loved. This kind of thing is very appreciated when you're, you, I mean, not every day can people have, you know, an extra money to put $500 on a dog's shots, you know, so it is nice for everybody to help out and do these things for people out there that can't do these things for themselves. People's reception seem very positive. People love their animals and like to talk about them, and I think we helped out and made a little bit of a difference today. This event wouldn't be possible without this wonderful grant from the ASPCA and with their support and also the support of Mounds Pet Food Warehouse, the Boys and Girls Club of Dane County, we're able to put on these events and we're excited to put on more in the upcoming year. Great question. The question is, um, in the community programs shown, how do you handle it if you find a medical problem that needs attention and you can't handle it on that, the day of those programs? Um, and we find that with spay-neuter programs too. We'll have animals come in for their scheduled spay-neuter. We'll find a pro problem that really needs medical attention. So it's always good to try to partner with full-service veterinary hospitals um, so that you can refer these patients to them and in the case of the spay neuter program in buffalo new york that we established we have a special fund for these animals because we know that if they've come to a community day or if they've come to seek low cost spay neuter they may not have the resources to do that so we give the recommendation and then oftentimes we can then couple it with some resources for that person to obtain those services Okay, so you might be asking, what's the results of GIS used in this way? And I don't have much to report on that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, the ASPCA is evaluating several communities where spay neuter interventions have been implemented based on intake data mapped through GIS, and they're always updating ASPCAPro.org with any new things that they find, with any research that's been done and we have the results for, so best to follow those results on ASPCAPro.org. But another interesting thing about GIS is that it was initially developed to target spay-neuter resources. We're also using it in other ways, um, maybe to target other safety net programs for dogs, like we saw in that one example, adult dogs who may be surrendered. If you dig deeper into that data, it may be that they need training programs in those particular locations. Or they're now using it to increase adoptions too. Um, what areas if within the service area that they, they have um, have had a lot of adoptions, have had little adoptions, can we increase our scope of adoptions by, by looking at those data. So I'm pretty much done, which is kind of early. <laughs> but if you guys have questions, please, by all means, ask your questions, give your comments based on your experiences. Yeah. So this is a holder of a question from our morning session. Um, with the various models of delivering spay neuter, um, how do volunteers fit into those programs? What they can and cannot do? Um, what they what they should and should not do? Um, and 
I have to say the mobile programs that I'm most familiar with don't utilize volunteers all that much. Um, the environment on the mobile clinic tends to be very small and enclosed, and having extra bodies in that space tends to be a challenge. I think she's thinking of the natural Okay, so right? if volunteers for mobile clinics, we might be able to use them in cl a clerical capacity, um, cleaning, stuff like that, making appointments. For match programs, volunteers are heavily utilized, and they're mostly in um, arranging which animals are going to be spayed and neutered that day for when the MASH program comes to town. And that might be all sheltered animals, all rescue animals, it might be public, all public animals, or it might be a mix of the two. So they generally make the appointments, they may take the money, and then they pay the MASH program for coming on site for that day. And that's actually beneficial to the MASH program too because they they trust that their, those volunteers in those communities know their population best. And they also, if, that, if they know that they need to pay the MASH program for coming, they're going to fill those, those spots to capacity. Um, stationary spay neuter clinics, we've used volunteers in doing laundry, wrapping, cleaning and wrapping surgical instrument packs, um, and also a lot of people don't like using volunteers for monitoring animals post-recovery, um, but in some cases it works really well. Um, we've had nurses, retired nurses, retired medical professionals who we could train and feel confident that they could tell us that this animal has continued to breathe through their recovery um, and that they can monitor their heart rate for us. And if necessary, take the animal's temperature, respond to hypothermia, hypothermia and if there's any problems, get either a technician or a veterinarian. Um, and some, some places don't like doing that. They would prefer that they have paid staff doing that. Um, and also, um, Dr. Newberry, just for our online folks, mentioned that she has worked with spay neuter programs that have had successful volunteers programs incorporated within there. Um, it does take a large amount of time and energy to train them appropriately, um, and it has worked out well in the programs she's been affiliated may be good to have volunteers be trained to do one specific item over and over again so that they feel confident in what they're doing and they can do the job adequately. Other questions, comments? I had actually one other comment if there's no other questions. Um, just so you guys are aware of it, Dr. Gary Petronic uh, wrote an article, one of the first articles that was really in the sheltering field using GIS data. What, what he, I'm talking about articles that were written by Dr. Gary Petronic or an article um, using GIS, and what he did was actually compare um, the risk of euthanasia in a shelter to um, the risk of premature mortality in humans using the GIS. So he sort of overlaid the two onto maps um, in Boston. Um, and found that there was a very strong correlation between those things. And so that might be a place when we think of kind of like, well, where do we go next? Sometimes spay-neuter is the intervention that we want to reduce risk um, of death in a shelter. But as Dr. Makalinski pointed out, sometimes it may be something else. There may be other socioeconomic factors that are contributing and so in his study, he, he was really able to see that those two things really correlated. And there's obvious sort of, again, correlations, socioeconomic correlations for why we would be seeing um, human premature mortality. And um, so to start really thinking about, we often think of spay neuter as the intervention to reduce shelter intake. Um, but we need to think when we're looking at communities for what other things are contributing to it too. San Diego also did a kind of interesting study looking at the risk in their shelter and one of the, their biggest risk items that they saw was neonatal kittens coming in um, who needed a lot of care. Um, but in other communities we see very few neonatal animals coming in and instead we see these one and a half year old adult dogs um, with behavior problems are, are much more at risk than those other animals. So there's lots of ways to think of using GIS data. Thanks, Dr. Newberry. Anybody else? 
Uh, yes, the study that we showed, or the map that we showed for New York City that showed the intake for adult dogs versus puppies. Those were specifically pit bulls, pit bull type dogs. Um, the study that the ASPCA is doing is looking at why large dogs are surrendered in New York City. Um, so it's not specifically pit bull type dogs, it's large dog breeds as a whole, and we don't have results for that yet. Um, but if you follow ASPCA Pro, Dr. Emily Weiss, um, you can find results about that. What interesting, I'm sorry, James. Okay. What interesting thing that correlates with the large dog issue, the Center for Shelter Dogs actually did a study that showed that large dogs were more at risk of staying longer in shelters. So even if they had positive outcomes, um, they were likely to stay longer. Um, and so we know that that automatically kind of puts them at higher risk. Anybody else? Okay, thank you guys so much for coming and for your comments, your wonderful comments and contributions to the questions. And I hope you find the information valuable as you continue your veterinary education and work in shelters. Thank you very much for coming today.